available worldwide on the internet. This is the number one talk show online, the world famous Jiggy Jaguar Show. Welcome back to the big broadcast, coast to coast, and border to border, all over the world wide web, and on 50 plus stations throughout the U.S. and Canada, AM, FM. KFRK in Denver, Colorado, and our good friends at K Rocks Radio in Casper, Wyoming, among others. We are live 2 to 5 Central, 3 to 6 Eastern, and 12 to 3 Pacific, Monday through Friday. Number 24 7 at JiggyCheckWire.com. We're going to be talking with uh, George Nuttle here in a few moments. He's controversial, he's hard hitting, and he's a highway patrol officer for more than 30 years in the San Diego area. Retired a few years ago to become a writer, debuting impressively with a wild book. It's called Cops, Crooks, and other crazies. George, welcome to the program. I love the title of this book, Cops, Crooks, and Other Crazies. How are you? Well, it's very good, yeah. Well, it's about my 31 years in law enforcement in California, and it yeah. tells the inside story of what law enforcement was really like from 1952 to 83, which very few people know about the inside workings of police work. Well, why did, why did you decide to write this book? Well, uh, I was prompted by a friend of mine who got me involved in the D.B. Cooper skyjacking case. He was my San Diego PD partner in December 52 and January 53. And I told him about all the, the crazy things that happened when I was all over the state on the highway patrol with little Mickey Mouse police departments and sheriff's offices and all. And... Uh, so I wrote that, and then uh, then he got me involved in the uh, D.B. Cooper skyjacking case to investigate that. And uh, he wanted me to confirm his theory that D.B. Cooper's wildlife scattered remains were on one of the Columbia River Islands. So I went up there for uh, nine days in uh, Washington at his home to confirm his theory. And... Uh, we ran across all kinds of things that uh, proved us beyond any doubt that this was a J. Edgar Hoover FBI cover-up because uh, J. Edgar Hoover was being blackmailed by the mafia with proof of his homosexuality, and they were bankrolling his horse race gambling addiction losses. And uh, but, but the most obvious thing about this case that it was a cover-up is that there was no report at any time that uh, fly, uh D.B. Cooper's Skyjack flight was ever tracked on radar by the Portland International Airport air traffic controllers. And the FAA rule is that all planes in flight are tracked, and they're recorded. The recording of where they are and all is retained for 15 days, at least 15 days. And uh, the FBI had agents all over the Portland International Airport at the time that the plane was approaching there. And uh, there's no report of them going to the monitor the air traffic controllers and no report of them. And if they had even looked at the recording, which was retained for 15 days, they would have known that Cooper jumped within the airspace of the Portland International Airport, and they could have cleaned this, they could have finished this case up in a matter of uh, a few days, less than a week anyway. And then the next thing was uh, the the FBI had the serial numbers of the $10,020 bills when they got the money in Seattle, and uh, but uh, they didn't release that the the uh, list of ten thousand serial numbers for two years, and uh, a Secret Service agent confirmed to me that the lifetime expectancy of a twenty dollar bill is only eighteen to twenty four months, uh, and then uh, the uh, see the. Uh, well, that that is a uh, that that is actually <laughs> what what is the uh, what that I, I like the idea of uh, uh, you you brought up the thing there about the twenty dollar bill. Um, give us a little bit more details on that because that's a uh, that's fascinating. Well, like I say, they uh, they withheld uh, actually the Monday after the Thanksgiving weekend when. Uh, D.B. Cooper pulled his skyjacking. There's a, in the two books that uh, I uh, researched, yeah. it shows that G, uh, J. Edgar Hoover sent a letter with all these serial numbers only to banks and, and money institutions. Well, who's going to have time at a bank or any business place 
to compare a $20 bill with 10,000 numbers, which is absolutely ridiculous. But that was merely just a, uh, a fake attempt. And then the other thing was that uh, then the, the FBI, dozens of FBI agents and uh, local law enforcement and two or 4,000 Fort Lewis soldiers <coughs> searched, didn't start searching a ground search for Cooper until over three months after he jumped. And they searched up around Woodland and Ariel, Washington, based on a computer printout from Minnesota, the headquarters of uh, Northwest Oriental Mines, but they didn't look at the recording uh, at the Portland International Airport of where the plane was. And uh, so why, and then when my partner and I, <clears throat> my partner sent a letter to this retired Portland, uh, Portland FBI special agent innocently <clears throat> and gave his uh, very highly confidential phone number to this agent, thinking that he wouldn't pass it on to anybody else because uh, that became a rule in the mid-60s that law enforcement officers' home phone numbers and addresses were not to be revealed to anybody other than law enforcement. And lo and behold, uh, this retired Green Beret sergeant phoned my uh, partner and tried to stop him from searching for Cooper's remains. And then after he called him, he says, oh, and the uh, FBI agent's going to call you shortly, and he did at 9.30 a.m., and then my partner was searching the Columbia River Islands. They roamed by the Port of Portland, and you were, got access only by getting an access permit from the Port of Portland. And they gave him a uh, permit very willingly and a little excitedly, thinking he might find Cooper or something about him. And uh, they gave him one permit for Hayden Island. He searched that. And then after I went up there, we, uh, he applied for a permit for Government Island, which was the most likely one. It's uh, six miles long and a mile wide in the middle, tapered, and, uh, and they refused to give him one more permits. And, of course, after he had notified this FBI agent that he was searching. Now, the thing is, his theory of where Cooper jumped was based on two things. One was, when I went up there, we went up and spent two hours with the parachute rigger, who was a parachute expert and instructor, and he convinced us that Cooper plunged to his death because he was wearing a business suit, an outdated business suit with narrow lapels, a narrow black tie, white shirt, light black uh, raincoat, and slip-on loafers. And he jumped into about a 212-mile-an-hour headwind in about 60 to 70 degrees below freezing wind chill factor. And in a storm that uh, one Continental pilot described as one of the worst storms he'd experienced in 24 years of flying. And uh, the parachute expert told us that he says but he would have spun when he jumped off of the air stairs, the rear air stairs, and by the time he, he'd have to get face down to pull the ripcord, and he says the ripcord on this NB-8 emergency pilot chute that he'd used was difficult to deploy under the best of conditions, and he jumped under the worst of conditions, and when he stopped spinning, he jumped from 10,000 feet. He had less than 60 seconds to hit the ground, and uh, his fingers would have been too numb to pull the, the chute. Now, the other thing is it confirms that is that in February 10th, 1980, an 80-year-old boy named Brian Ingram was, uh, and his family was out for a picnic, and he was clearing an area to build a fire to roast some wieners, and he uncovered $5,800 of uh, Cooper's uh, ransom money. And that was proven to be actually uh, part of Cooper's money. And the only way it could have got there was in October 1974, the Army Corps of Engineers dredged the Columbia River because, of course, it's a, a freight uh, line up to Portland, Then they have to keep it 40 feet deep. And the 
dredge pipe, my partner told me it was about six feet in diameter, and the, the uh, parachute rigger also told us that one of the chutes returned to him had the canvas carrying case removed because the bank money bags were like a pillowcase. They had no securing device, and they were just cotton. And uh, so, and he had tethered the, the stewardess that stayed on the plane with him. Uh, he had tethered the uh, $200,000 to his waist with about a six-foot-long uh, shroud line from another chute that he had uh, torn apart. And uh, so the theory is that he came down at about 126 miles an hour or more, hit the top of a pine tree, and that money bag went flying off into the Columbia River, and then down about 16 miles to Tina Bar, where it settled on the bottom wow. of the, the uh, river until the Army Corps of Engineers pumped it up in, into the uh, under the Tina's Bar, they call it. <laughs> and after he found the money, then the FBI went up with a backhoe, and they dug down under where he found it, and they found pieces of $20 bills three feet deep in the sandy bank. And... Uh, so the only conclusion we could come to was that all of the money went up there and uh, in chunks, and uh, most of it just flowed back into the river and down down the river, and and uh, we had to say that it was probably eaten by the fish because it's about 80 miles from the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. And uh, the uh, also the. See the uh, the money. When when I uh, this uh, Portland retired Portland FBI special agent phoned me the night before I flew up there to Portland, yeah, and uh, Washington, and uh, he told me that they had sent the money to the FBI laboratory, and they had determined that that fifty eight hundred dollars was the, probably the middle part of fourteen thousand dollars that was stuck under uh, stuck together in the water for years and uh, of course the, the money was all rotted away around the edges yeah and uh, so then it goes on and on and I, I am actually and unfortunately my partner when they refused to give money more access permits to the islands he just told me well it's all yours uh, do what you want to with it so I wrote a letter to uh, FBI Director Lewis Free explaining my profile of Cooper and his theory of where Cooper's remains were. And my profile of Cooper is, and this is pretty well substantiated, that he was a former or retired Green Beret, compulsive gambler, over his head in debt to mafia loan sharks in Las Vegas, and they give him his very last warning to pay up or else. Wow. Well, if you've seen the movie Casino, <laughs> Tony Spilatro moved to uh, from Chicago to Las Vegas uh, in April 71, just seven months before Cooper uh, jumped. Yeah. And uh, in the movie, uh, and of course there was a rule in the mafia that there were not to be any killings, mafia killings in Las Vegas because they didn't want people to know they were there. Yeah. And uh, But uh, Tony Spilatro was a loose cannon, as you probably got if you saw the movie Casino. And they found five <clears throat> loan sharks' bodies out on the desert. And then in the movie it showed that he took up loan sharking at 3% per week. Wow. And then, <laughs> then when I sent wow. the letter to uh, Louis Free, uh, two months later on a Saturday I got a response from uh, the FBI, an inspector, and he said they had sent a copy of my letter to their Seattle FBI office, and uh, if they had any questions, they'd call me. And, uh, or if I had any more information, they gave me the phone number and address. So I thought, well, it's all over. And then the following Thursday at about 9 a.m., I get a call from the, at that time, the chief uh, Cooper case agent. Uh, and immediately when he, I answered the phone, he said, we did receive a call from Las Vegas that somebody there was going to commit a major crime in the Pacific Northwest. Well, that was the only major crime. And then he went on to tell me that one of the previous uh, uh, chief Cooper case agents uh, had graduated number two in his uh, Naval Academy class, 
he had a very high intelligence rate, probably over genius, but his supervisors harassed him so much that he quit the FBI and uh, went to work for, uh, I think it was Ross Perot. The guy was a, a mental giant. And I wow. asked him, I said, well, <laughs> would, uh, could I get in touch with him? And he said, no, I don't think so. He yeah. said, uh, <laughs> because when he quit and walked out the door, he said, I don't want any more to do with the FBI or the D.B. Cooper case. Well, that confirmed to me. Now, it's my belief that when this person called from Las Vegas to tell about somebody going to commit a major crime in the Northwest, yeah. that they no doubt told him the true name of D.B. Cooper. I mean, you know, the FBI just didn't take a... And if a person called up there, they certainly would uh, give him more than just a hint. Yeah. And uh, so... And uh, now, there's there's any number of other... Th oh, and then uh, this... Uh, this agent said that uh, the FBI was developing a profile on Cooper. Well, then he went on to call Cooper uh, an ex-con uh, over uh, wanting to make a, la a last big hit, and he was no more than a rotten, sleazy crook. Well, that is not a professional <laughs> profile. I mean, this guy's a real cornball. And uh, <laughs> so... Uh, like I told you about my my profile of him, and uh, then there was a uh, uh, let's see, just amazing, amazing anyway, stuff. Anyway, then another thing is now my book. Unfortunately, the publisher in New York went busted, and it's no, it's not, it's temporarily not available through Amazon. Yeah, but I'm having it reprinted. And it will come out uh, uh, about uh, April 1st. And my new printer is trying to work it out with uh, Amazon to get it on the Amazon. And uh, But the thing is, after my book came out, the first edition, uh, I got calls from a journalist and an attorney who were both aspiring uh, D.B. Cooper authors. And, and uh, they didn't know hardly anything about the case. They had some wild... Yeah. One of them said, well... I know there's so-and-so. He says, he's a compulsive gambler. And I said, my God. I said, there are millions of compulsive gamblers. <laughs> I go to the Inn Casinos, <coughs> and you can hardly find a parking space. Yeah. And uh, I used to go down there when they were paying off, but now they don't. And uh, uh, so anyway, then the other one, the journalist, had been in touch with this Green Beret, retired Green Beret sergeant that tried to stop my partner from searching. And he says he's stupid and he's a liar. <laughs> well, he gave his phone number. And he's I stupid and he's a liar. I love that. <laughs> well, oh, he is. I mean, this guy can't remember one lie from one day, one day to the next. <laughs> Sounds and, like uh, my ex-wife, actually. <laughs> Go. <laughs> I, I, I called him and I said, uh, I says, well, when did you retire from the Green Berets? He's in 1978. I said, what did you do after that? He said, I worked for the FBI. <laughs> well, I know wow. the FBI. <laughs> and, and what they did is the only way you can work for the FBI is to be a janitor, a clerk, or a paid informant. Yes. And they pay in untraceable cash. And uh, so then he told me that he knew uh, 19, April 1972 skyjacker Richard Floyd McCoy Jr., who skyjacked a United plane for $500,000. He was immediately caught, convicted, sent to prison, and uh, and escaped and was uh, killed by the FBI in a shootout. So he says he knew McCoy. Well, now get this. In this one book, uh, D.B. Cooper, The Real McCoy, there was a retired FBI supervised an agent from Salt Lake City and a retired federal parole officer that tried to prove that Cooper was McCoy. Well, it was ridiculous. Uh, they knew that McCoy was 29, and the best witnesses said that Cooper was 45 to 50. He had dark brown eyes. Uh, McCoy had blue eyes, and it goes on and on and on. <coughs> but the valuable part of that was 
and trying to prove they were the same, they said that they got credit card receipt, copies of credit card receipts of McCoy's, showed that he bought 5.7 gallons of gas in Cedar City, Utah, Thanksgiving Eve, the day before Thanksgiving, the day that Cooper jumped, and then bought the same amount of gas in Las Vegas on Thanksgiving Day. And then they got his home phone records, and it showed that somebody, which it had to be him, uh, phoned home from the Tropicana Hotel pay phone less than half a mile from the McCarran Airport. And so the thing is, he was a Mormon Sunday school teacher, and Mormons don't drink coffee or booze or gamble or smoke or cuss or do anything else bad. And he left his wife and two little kids under age five at home for those two holiday holidays. And so I said, my God, if... If the retired Green Beret sergeant knew McCoy and McCoy knew Cooper, then he had to have known Cooper and by his true name. So uh, I called him, like I said, I think uh, I'd called him at 1 p.m. for four Sundays in a row. And so the last time I called him, I said, <clears throat> I said, uh, you know, and I explained it to him. I said, if you knew McCoy and McCoy knew Cooper, then you had to have known who Cooper was in the Green Berets. And he said, no, Cooper was never in the Green Berets. I said, well, if you don't know who he was, then how do you know if he's in the Green Berets or not? <laughs> I mean, uh, so anyway, it, it, it's just, uh, it's such an airtight case. Uh, but the FBI, of course, uh, they operate a lot like the mafia. They have a code of silence. And in fact, <clears throat> this... Uh, when I let it be known, I wrote a 55-page summary, which is in my book, and I sent it to five senators. Return receipt requested. Unfortunately, I wrote in there that this this uh, chief special agent had told me about the call from Vegas and some other things about the the uh, National Academy graduate quitting. And lo and behold, I called up there two times. He wasn't there in Seattle, and he returned my call. <clears throat> and he was very, very, uh, I mean, he, he treated me like I was another FBI agent. And then the third time I called up there, the uh, receptionist says, well, he's no longer here. I said, where is he? Jacksonville, Florida. So I called Jacksonville, Florida, FBI field office, left messages. He never called me back. They had punished him for even discussing the case with me. And uh, I, I felt very bad about that because he was such a nice guy. And then after uh, I was called, this attorney that thought his friend, uh, compulsive gambler, was uh, Cooper, I gave him these two names of this, uh, of these two Seattle uh, agents who had been chief case agents. He called them. Somehow he got their phone numbers, and they, they wouldn't tell him a thing, just silence. He would, they wouldn't answer any questions. Well, that proves again, that, which I've known for a long time. I had contact with several FBI agents in my 31 career, and none of them were any good. They're all take and no give. And, uh, of course, J. Edgar Hoover built it that way. And he denied the existence of the mafia until the day he died. And... Uh, Incidentally, in my research, uh, Sam Giancana, the Chicago godfather, he had moved to Mexico City. And uh, D.B. Cooper said that he wanted to fly to Mexico City. Well, Sam Giancana had gone down there in 1966 when it got too hot for him in Chicago. He was the... Uh, uh, welcome alien guest of the president of Mexico. But he bailed out as soon as he could. He bailed out over uh, Portland, Portland, uh, Oregon. Well, to me, and also in this book, Double Cross by Sam Giancana's younger half-brother, Chuck, he said that uh, Sam was in charge of all loan sharks west of Chicago. And... Uh, 
and that he had smuggled millions of dollars across the border from the United States to Mexico City, and they used a, a Catholic priest uh, as a courier, and they called him Father Cash. And uh, so anyway, it, here's the thing. He, named, he gave the name Dan Cooper, not D.B. Some UPI uh, reporter heard D.B. Cooper in Oregon and put it on the, but it, on the uh, wire. But actually, he was Dan Cooper. Well, the definition of Dan in the dictionary is a title of honor equivalent to a master or sir. And the number one word in the mafia is honor. <clears throat> when you become a made man, you're a man of honor. And Mexico City... So here I am, oh, and the third definition of Cooper is to furnish or fix up. I'm an honorable man, I'll fix up my debt to you. I'm going to uh, Mexico City, Sam G. and Condor with the money. Okay. Uh, and, and so you put all of these things together, it's like about a 24-piece child's jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> and every, every, everything, everything fits perfectly. And uh, the trouble is that I, I my interest is, ultimate interest is to try to get this on a TV documentary to explain and present all the stuff that I've uh, told you and uh, much more. Uh, it goes on and on. Or, of course, a silver screen movie. Uh, but, uh, but the one thing is, whether that ever happens or not, I think the American people have a right to know what was going on in this country all the time that DB or uh, Jed Grahoo yeah. was the director of the FBI. Well, uh, I I hate I hate to cut you off, my friend, but George, we've we've got to go, my friend. We've uh, we we've definitely ran over our time with you, my friend. But I appreciate you being on with us today. Well, I appreciate it very much, and thank you very much. And say hello to. Are you in Texas now? Uh, yes, we are. We are live in Texas uh, and and around the country on uh, fifty stations. Very good. Okay, well, thanks a million. Definitely. Well, uh, uh